Holy Father, once again we bow in your eternal presence. And as is always the case, we beg you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come and meet us in your word and reveal its truth to us, its meaning to us. Reveal to us its import on our life this day and in this place. We know it is not something that we can track down or hunt down. You have to tell us. And so, Father, today I pray that you will overcome the inadequacies of human communication. The tricky part about speaking and the tricky part about hearing that you will meet with us in our hearts, in our minds, and deliver to us the message you have for us on this day. And Father, may it not just be another notch on our belt, another uh, tidbit of accumulated information, but it may, be, may it be that spark that causes us to truly be the light in the darkness. May it, may it truly be that thing that makes us to be the salt in this world. Help us to fulfill our purpose of existence, and that is to glorify your holy name. We thank you for including us in your great redemptive plan. And Father, as is always the case, as your word goes out, it calls into your presence all those who do not know you in some personal way that they might be by the end of this service more than able to call you not only God, but my Father, my Savior. We ask that humbly today in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would join me, if you care, would you join me to open with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 28. And with apologies to Led Zeppelin, today we're going to talk about the stairway to heaven. And if you're too young or too old to know what that means, just ask somebody around you. Let's read our text for today, beginning in verse 10. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he came to a certain place. And he spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and he lay down in that place and he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set upon the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. <coughs> Excuse me. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am Yahweh, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants shall also be like the dust of the earth. You shall spread out to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south. And in you and in your descendants, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And behold, I am with you. And I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And Jacob was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. <clears throat> As we open this passage, we see our current subject of study, Jacob. He is Jacob the deceiver, and he is now running for his life away from the murderous intents of his brother Esau. But to be fair, he is at the same time obeying his father's command. The command to find a wife from among the family stock back in Haran, where they came from, rather than <clears throat> from among the women of Canaan or the daughters of Ishmael. 
On his way from Beersheba to the east, he stops near an ancient Canaanite city called Luz to spend the night. Uh, Jacob is obviously traveling light. No doubt he's traveling light so that he can travel fast. He doesn't have any camping equipment with him, so he has to use a rock for a pillow. And after all, you know, traveling through the hills and the mountains of Canaan, it's hard work, it's steep country. And so Jacob falls fast asleep. And when he does, he has a supernatural visitor. I would read to you again verse 12. And he had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. I would call your attention to that word ladder. It's the, it's the Hebrew word sulam, sulam. Now, in previous generations, thanks largely to the King James Version, this was known as Jacob's Ladder. But most contemporary scholars prefer to interpret the term, translate the term as a stairway, simply because it's hard for them to visualize the simultaneous ascending and descending on, of angels on something that is normally as narrow as a ladder. It's difficult to translate because the word appears only here in the entire Old Testament, and there are very few uses of this word outside Scripture. So they don't really know for sure. Is it ladder? Is it stairway? What is it? Well, we don't know. And to be fair, in the final analysis, it doesn't matter what word you use, stairway or ladder, does it? What matters is why did God give this vision to Jacob? Why? And more to the point, what does it mean for us today? If you care to take out your outlines and follow along, let's begin to work our way through this passage. And the first thing I want us to look at is the purpose of the stairway. The purpose of the stairway to heaven. By a vast majority... Humanity believes in some kind of life after this earthly existence. I know all the talking heads on TV would tell you otherwise. All the people who make all the noise would tell you otherwise. That there are only a few little uh, ignorant people cloistered in some out-of-the-way place that believe in life after death, and that just ain't so. Pardon the grammar. Every study, every sociologist, everyone knows most people Everyone in this entire world knows this ain't it. Furthermore, humanity believes overwhelmingly in a single supreme deity that controls the location and the quality of your life after this earthly life. And the existence in a place of happiness and satisfaction is almost, without exception, given the name heaven. Have you ever thought about how weird that is? Buddhists talk about heaven. Muslims talk about heaven. They all name the final destination the same name. They all call it heaven. And again, heaven is almost universally as understood as being above and, and beyond this earthly realm. Now, we all know specific details about this heaven will vary greatly from religion to religion, but almost all religions believe that heaven is somewhere up there. So now comes the most important question in all of human existence. Is there a way to heaven? If that's the place of ultimate satisfaction, ultimate contentment, ultimate joy and happiness and blah, 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 I want to go. How do I get there? Is there a way? And so at least in part, this vision is given to speak First and foremost to Jacob, 
but beyond Jacob to all of humanity to answer this most important question in all of the world. There is a heaven and yes, there is a way. You see, this vision affirms there is a heaven far high above ordinary human existence. This vision affirms there is a way to get to heaven. That's what this object is. It reaches, the scripture says, from earth to heaven. And it affirms there really is a God in control of it all. He, he stands at the top of this stairway in a position demonstrating his control over access to heaven. And that it is heaven, which is the destination of this stairway, is not only spoken of in the scriptures, it's evidenced by the presence of heavenly beings. We call them angels. And that it is God's heaven, that he's not just a visitor or a spectator there. It is evidenced by the fact that these angels are busily ascending and descending its heights. This is to signify the activity of the angels in carrying out the commands of God, in dutifully reporting back to his commanding presence. It demonstrates for us the fact that God is neither absent nor inattentive, inattentive about the goings-on of earth. And this flurry of angelic activity reflects God's all-powerful, all-knowing, all-encompassing presence. And so, yes, this vision is given to answer the anxious question of all of humanity. Is there a way to heaven? Well, yes, and it's this stairway. But there's one more thing we need to note before we move on. There's only one stairway. There's not another stairway over here. There's not a rope over there. Not a series of rocks somewhere. No, nope, this is it. A single, solitary stairway reaching from earth to heaven. Multiple ways to heaven are not portrayed in this vision. And we know from experience every single religion strains and rushes to convince humanity that it alone represents that one single way. Well, this vision also clearly represents the origination of the stairway to heaven. The origination, where did it come from? This is important. This is important. Jacob did not build this stairway. He did not construct it. He did not search for it across the land of Canaan and stumble upon it. He did not discover this stairway. No, this way to heaven is brought to and delivered to Jacob by the originator of the way to heaven. We see this in that God stands at its top. The top of the stairway locates the position of power over this way. He stands at the top of the ladder and he controls that ladder. And if you've ever tried to climb a ladder leaning up against a house or a tree and someone is up there, you know what I mean, right? It's a position of power. God is situated at the top, looking down upon all who would desire to gain entrance into heaven. And furthermore, this vision pictures the way to heaven as flowing from the creating and controlling power of the one true God. It is God who is the originator. It is God who is the owner of this stairway. It is God who is the controller of this stairway. And that's why he stands at the top. But that God is the originator of this way to heaven is also seen in that he commands its angelic activity. These 
agents of heaven. Hurry about their assignments. And as they do, they pay absolutely no attention to their human onlooker. These, these angels could care less that Jacob's laying over here. No, no, they, they have something else in mind. Clearly, God, who stands at the top of the stairway, he is the focus of their attention. He is the nexus of their activity as they present themselves before the divine presence and then rush away from that presence to accomplish his command. He's in charge. The presence of this busy angelic host serves not only to assure Jacob that he's really not alone after all in this certain place. Note that. We'll get back to that in a couple of weeks. But that he is in receipt of a divine communication. We know that because angels frequently accompany messages that are delivered by God. And the message on this day is most certainly, behold, the way to heaven. That God alone is the originator and the commander of this way to heaven is further demonstrated by the fact that God alone spoke. No other voice dares to break the silence of this holy night, God is present. So all other lips are sealed. The angels hurry about their work as silent servants. And when God speaks from his position of power above the stairway, he speaks what? He speaks the covenant blessing of Abraham and Isaac. And now he speaks it to Jacob for the very first time. We can summarize it in verse 13 where God says, the land on which you lie, I will give it to you and your descendants. But God's not through speaking. He continues to speak from his position of authority until he has completed the two-part promise that he first made to Abraham. Part of that promise is, is recorded in verse 15. I am with you. And part of that promise is included in verse 14. You shall be blessed. God speaks. And no other voice on heaven or on earth He's qualified to break the quiet stillness of this night. No other voice dares to add to or take away from the divine edict. No one that is until the confession erupts from Jacob's own mouth. Surely the Lord Yahweh is in this place. Previously, we looked at the purpose of this stairway to heaven, and the purpose was to reveal that, yes, in fact, there is a way to heaven. But now, now we are prepared to explore the meaning of the stairway to heaven. And the meaning of this stairway begins to reveal itself as we realize that God had spoken his promise. Let's listen again to the voice of God recorded in verse 15. He says, I will not leave you until I have done all that I have promised you. And I just want to ask you today, is land and relatives, descendants, is, is, is that all that God promised? No. Skip back one verse to verse 14. And in you, God says, and in your descendants shall all of the families of earth be blessed. Do you realize that you are part of that all? <laughs> You're included in all. All means all, right? Under the umbrella of promise was God's commitment of giving property. We call it the promised land. It was of giving people the many, many descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it was 
the presence of God when he continually reaffirms, I will be with you. But, but this promise notably includes a blessing to all the families of earth through Jacob. Jacob is so overwhelmed by this word from God that he says in verse 17, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Now, mentioning the gate that leads to the way to heaven should make us, it should remind us of another time when God spoke about a gate within the context of the covenant blessing of Abraham. And the covenant blessing of Abraham is not about just lands and people and property. The covenant blessing of, of, of Abraham is how to find the way to heaven. There's another time when God spoke about that to humankind. It's recorded for us in Matthew 7 when God the Son spoke these words. He said, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction and many are those who enter by it. For the gate is small and the way, the way is narrow that leads to life. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe it's a ladder after all. When Jesus spoke those words in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, might he have had this encounter with Jacob in mind when he began to describe the gate that leads to the way of life? Is it just possible that Jesus takes up the promise spoken to Jacob about a gate and is beginning to redirect notions and understandings about this gate, redirecting notions to himself. Well, even if that's not clearly his objective in the Sermon on the Mount, it is in other places. In the very first chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus is beginning to assemble his disciples, the original twelve. You remember how that string of events happens. John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, once again, behold, the Lamb of God. So John the Apostle and Andrew immediately leave John the Baptist and begin to follow Jesus. Scripture tells us that very soon Andrew summons his brother, Simon Peter, and the next day Jesus calls a fellow by the name of Philip and says to Philip, follow me. And he does. Philip then immediately goes out to find another fella by the name of Nathaniel. You remember that exchange, don't you? Philip goes to Nathaniel and he says, we have found him of whom the Moses and the law and the prophets all spoke of. It's Jesus of Nazareth. You remember that because you remember the smart aleck reply, right? Can any good thing I'm out of Nazareth. Philip very wisely answers, come and see. And so Nathaniel does. And as Nathaniel begins to approach Jesus, Jesus speaks first. You remember? And you remember what Jesus says when he speaks first? He looks at Nathanael and he says, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Fancy word for pretense or pretend or puffed up. No, no Nathanael, he's a nuts and bolts kind of guy. Just the facts, ma'am. And consistent with his nature, Nathanael asks a question. How do you know me? And then it gets pooky, doesn't it? Because Jesus says, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Ooh, cue the spooky music. How did Jesus know Nathaniel was under a fig tree before Philip went to him? 
Well, hello, that's the point, isn't it? That's the point. And Nathaniel figures it out because the next thing Nathaniel says is, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus effectively says, Ha, ah, that's nothing. He says, Because I said that I saw you under the fig tree, you believe, you shall see greater things than these. Greater things? Well, like what? Well, <laughs> Ultimately, the greater thing that Nathaniel will see will be the bodily resurrection of Jesus after his crucifixion. But the scene doesn't end there, does it? To whet the appetite of Nathaniel for what is to come, Jesus says one more little thing. It's recorded for us in the 51st verse. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, hello, this is most obviously a reference to Jacob's vision. So the question becomes, why bring it up now? Why, why bring it up here? Could it be? Could it be that when Jesus first saw this Israelite indeed in whom there is no gal, when he saw him lounging under the fig tree, could it be that Nathaniel was desperately trying to understand the meaning of the stairway to heaven? Could it be that at that moment in time when he's under the fig tree, he is deep in prayerful thought trying to figure out what is Jacob's vision? What does it mean? How do we find it? How do we climb it? What's the deal? What's going on? And so here in this first encounter, Jesus reveals, not only did I see you, I saw your thoughts. And in this reply, you shall see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In that, in that reply, Jesus is doing something else. He is beginning to reveal that this stairway is a person and not an object. It's a person, not an object. Well, Alan, that's kind of a stretch. Is it really? Flip over in John's Gospel just a couple of chapters. We'll very soon, we're going to come to the nighttime conversation with Nicodemus and Jesus. And in that conversation, Jesus will try to describe his own origin as well as the origins of heavenly life. And in chapter 3, Jesus says this, And no one has ascended to heaven, but he who descended from heaven. Who is that? Even the Son of Man. There it is. If there's any doubt that this is what Jesus is doing, he's trying to reveal that the stairway is not an object, it's a person. Well, consider this. Words recorded on the night before his crucifixion. That famous passage in John 14 where Jesus says, I am what? The way. I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father. You know, the guy who owns heaven? But through me. Jesus clearly says, I'm the way to heaven. It's me and nothing else. And that that is the meaning of the stairway of heaven must also be recognized as the understanding of the Apostle Paul. Listen to what Paul writes the Ephesians in chapter 4. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Now Paul's not going to comment on that Old Testament quotation. He's got something else in mind. And Paul says this. Now this expression, he ascended, what can it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? 
Now, yes, that may also be a reference to hell, but first and foremost, it's a reference to descending from heaven to earth. He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Paul, in these words, makes another truth painfully clear, and it's a truth that we've already mentioned, but I want to I hit that nail a couple of more times. Paul is making clear that Jacob did not build the stairway to heaven. It was not something that he put together from instructions that he got, you know, translated from Chinese. Jacob did not discover it. He did not find the stairway after careful searching. No, God delivers the stairway into Jacob's presence. God comes to where Jacob is and says, here. And that means God came down to Jacob. And that's what Paul says. He who descended is also he who ascended. You see, just as this stairway to heaven came down to Jacob, Jesus came down to earth. Jesus has come down to all humanity for one very simple reason. We can't go there. We cannot ascend to heaven. We cannot go to God. We cannot reach God. God must come and fetch us. And amazingly, he does just that. And that he does is prefigured in the delivery of of Jacob's vision, the stairway to heaven. Boy, that Jacob, he must have really been something special for God to personally have traveled to earth and for God to personally deliver this way to heaven. Just a little old Jacob. Boy, Jacob must have been something. Oh, he was, wasn't he? We, we, we've been following Jacob's life. Yeah, boy, he was something all right. In fact, he was so much something, we need to pause for a moment and take a look at this recipient of the stairway to heaven. Let's do that, shall we? Who exactly was this recipient of this great gift? Oh, he must have been special quality. Someone noble and great. Only somebody noble and great could be the beneficiary of the one thing that all humanity searches for, right? Who is this Jacob? Well, he is the most cowardly, the most deceiving, the most heel-grabbing supplanter we have encountered thus far in the book of Genesis. Yes, he's an award winner. Don't let this happen to you award. That's Jacob, right? Jacob is a real prize. And you know what? That's really good news for you and I. Because if someone like Jacob can become the beneficiary of the mercy and grace and God, of God, then maybe there's hope for you and I. You see, the message of Scripture is that God does not deliver his gifts to those who have no need of him. Oh, you Christians, you puny, weak-minded Christians, you just need a crutch. Hallelujah, I do. Give me one. Give me two, three. I do, absolutely. God finds the most needy. And then to them, he shows himself the most generous. And at this point in Genesis, there are few that are more needy than our buddy Jacob. Unless, of course, it's you and I. So on Jacob's part, what is his response? That's the final thing we need to look at. The response to the stairway to heaven. It is noteworthy for what Jacob does not do. 
You know what he doesn't do? He doesn't try to climb it. Does he? He doesn't try to climb it. Now let's think about this. Jacob, <laughs> unless in ancient Middle East there was some new way to do this, he probably slept the same way you and I do, laying down. And so when the vision begins, he likely rolls over onto his back so he gets a full view of this heavenly display. And what is Jacob's posture through this entire vision? That's it. <laughs> On his back, looking up. He never stirs. He never gets up. He never tries to do anything because there is nothing he can say. There's nothing he does because there's nothing for him to do. You see, Jacob quietly, humbly listens as God pronounces the conditions of the covenant. And Jacob's only response is, is in faith and trust of God's promise. It is as though Jacob understands the futility of any effort to try to get himself to heaven. Well, there's the stairway. All I got to do is climb it. Nope, doesn't work that way. See, the stairway is not for us to climb to God. It's for God to come down to us. Jacob is content to wait and to allow God to do all that God has promised. He will trust that God will come get him. Come get him. And at that realization, his joy erupts in spontaneous praise. How Awesome is this place. So beloved, I close this morning with a simple question. Has God shown you the stairway to heaven? Because if he has, that is his promise that he'll come and get you. He'll come and get you. And your response is not found in all the efforts of religion. Do this, do this, do this, do this. No. Mm -mm. Say this, say that. Say, no. Mm -mm. Your response is the joyful outpouring of praise. How awesome is our God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have made a way to heaven and that way is in your Son who left heaven and came to earth for us, for me. For those of us who in hope and in faith name the name of Jesus. We thank you because you have done for us what we could never do for ourselves and it is prefigured, it is previewed for us in this vision of the stairway to heaven. We thank you. We praise you. And may that gratitude change our lives. May it reorder our priorities. May it focus our energies. For we pray in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, please? <clears throat>